Until the 4th century BC, the town of Rome led a rather unremarkable life by the river Tiber. The Young Republic's foreign policy was so far limited to neighboring Etruscans and especially to nearby Latin tribes, where Rome sought to play a leading role. The era was marked by the endemic skirmishes of different communities fighting against each other. But then everything changed when the Celts attacked. We've already talked about the Celts and the Battle of Alia in the previous videos, but now we will look into just how big of a turning point this defeat really was for the Romans. It was from then on that the name of Celts or Gauls rose fear and hate in the Roman hearts. This grudge would be rooted so deep that centuries later the sacking of Rome would be used as an argument against admitting Gauls into the Senate. This conflict also brought the people of Rome closer together than ever before, gradually settling the differences between the patricians and plebeians, that is, between the classes of nobles and free commoners. This conflict has been dragging on for a while by then, but different laws brought increased privileges and opportunities to the plebeians. This culminated just over a century later, when the new law secured theoretically equal political rights of the two classes. Despite being poorer for about 327 kilograms of gold, as Livy tells us the cost of Celtic retreat was, Rome also commenced multiple big construction projects. Such was the great city wall, the Servian Wall, which included all seven hills that have been the heart and origin of the ancient city of Rome. Considering its length of 11 kilometers and the encompassed surface of 426 hectares, Rome then became the largest city in all of Italy. The walls were up to 10 meters tall and were an insurance that the devastation by Celts would not repeat itself. Beside the wall, the construction of the famous Via Appia also began, in order to easier transfer the Roman army and supplies southward. The construction of the first larger aqueduct for the city of Rome also belongs to this period. This Aqua Appia would bring the rising population of Rome 73,000 cubic meters of water per day. In parallel to this internal consolidation of Rome, the outward expansion followed. These include campaigns against the Celts and the conquest of nearby cities. Many of them were brought into the Roman sphere of influence through diplomacy and favorable treaties, like one which gave Rome the command over joint armies of allied Latin cities. A special mention deserves a treaty of friendship between Rome and another Mediterranean superpower, Carthage. As a result of common interests, they determined their own zone of influence, trade agreements and other details. With this, they prevented another major power, the Syracuse of Sicily, from expanding its influence. Rome waged multiple wars, be it of conquest or against uprisings, from which it always rose as a victor, even if its army suffered initial and individual defeats. The outcomes of these conflicts brought forth a peculiar custom of divide and conquer or divide and rule. For example, many loyal communities received Roman citizenship, while some maintained certain autonomy or gained partial citizenship, that is, citizenship without the right to vote. Others were put in a much worse position, even complete subjugation. Rome also increased its influence with the creations or expansion of settlements, colonies, that hosted immigrant Roman citizens and families along with local populace. This would later serve as epicenters for Romanization, spreading of Roman culture, values and lifestyle. After the sacking of Rome, the city rose from local conflicts to become a major power in the Mediterranean. It would be rash to equate the Celtic invasion of Rome as the sole reason for a sudden desire for world domination, it wasn't as simple as that. But it was probably one of the main causes for a string of changes that brought internal consolidation and massive expansion outward. The successes of internal and external politics further fueled the consequent successes of one another. It led to a domino effect that would see the Roman state expand through and beyond the Apennine Peninsula. The Roman army evolved into a paid, drilled and disciplined war machine that would always remain in battle readiness, ready to be deployed quickly and supplied regularly. Those that became Roman subjects, or allies, had to provide and subsidize warriors for its army, taking part in its successes and failures. Between that, the rise of colonies and the potential of a Roman citizenship, the term Latin didn't anymore describe an ethnic identity, but a political one instead. 
This part belonging beyond just to a local community, but also to the spreading Roman consciousness unlimited by ethnicity or geography. The young Roman Republic would soon need all the resources it has gained and use the lessons learned to fight other major powers in the region, like that of Epirus and, of course, Carthage, leading to the famous Punic Wars. The Celts who devastated Rome were skilled warriors and would be often used as mercenaries by Mediterranean powers, even by Hannibal. To learn more about Celts as warriors, their equipment and tactics, click on the next video or check the description down below. Be sure to like, subscribe, you know how YouTube works, and I'll bring you more history soon.